Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. You have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten, recording from the New York Public Library. And I'm here with Chad Gross, who's joining me from 55 Central Park West. Well, Chad, how's the grid holding up? <laughs> oh, man, uh, the grid is holding up pretty well. Uh, the grid, I, I was I was off grid last week, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I got the Rona again. But um, I, you got the kid version, though, didn't you? Because you caught I it did. from the kids. I, you got kid COVID. Yeah, it wasn't nearly as bad this time. I had like a really mild fever for like three days and uh-huh. uh, just, you know, just fatigued, really. And well, that's what uh, the kid bounce. COVID. That, that's what the kid COVID is. It's just like a Happy Meal version. Right. But I was frustrated because I was told on good authority that the pandemic was over. And then I got I the Rona. So yeah. I was really upset about that. But yeah. uh, oh, that's a whole other topic. Hey, man, I have been watching and I am up to <laughs> date on Rings of Power. Yeah. Uh, the Lord of the Rings series yeah. on Amazon. And uh, I have to be honest, the first two or three episodes, I thought, OK, this is weird. I had issues with casting especially Elrond, because I couldn't imagine if that guy aged for 3000 years that he would ever still look anything like Elrond. But that's a whole other point. But I was hanging in there, you know, I was like, this could get cool. This could get good. Every episode, there's just more and more about it. I don't like yeah. I, I guess a few things that come to mind is, is first the, the the Galadriel character is just insufferable. Yeah, uh, there is. She she's first of all, she's perfect. She doesn't do anything wrong. Uh, she's she's very, humble. Uh, yeah, right. So she's humble. teachable. I she's, know. She's so wise. And and, you know, with the with the streaming shows, I, I've seen enough streaming shows at this point to know that. Many times what happens is, is that they give you little clues, little breadcrumbs throughout the show, and you're trying to piece together what's happening. And then by the end of the season or the end of the show, whatever, whatever it may be, they come together in some respect. But I, you know, it's six episodes in now, and I'm very much at a point where, OK, you need to start giving me something here. Like, is it Sauron or is it not? Who's the strange guy who fell from the sky? Is it Saruman? Is it Gandalf? Like, who are these people? It's getting to the point where it's getting annoying. And then my other issue, and this is always one of those issues that you hate bringing up because people unfortunately take what you say and twist it. And I'm going to say what I mean. And if anybody takes it beyond that, then that's on them, is I have no problem with women who are heroes in superhero stories and fantasy stories and and whatever detective stories any kind at at the expense of making the woman the hero don't make the men incompetent or make them that they always have to be saved by the woman uh you know there should be some kind of balance and so i didn't expect a lot because of kind of a lot of the hubbub that was when it was coming out a lot of the things that were being said about it but i was really hoping that it would be better than it is. But so far, I, I got to say, the longer it goes on, the more disappointed I am. What do you think? Um, it's an unmitigated disaster. It's a dumpster <laughs> fire. Wow. It's a dumpster <laughs> fire floating down a river. So, so yeah. you like it. <laughs> uh, I just want to see how bad it'll get. And it gives me the context to watch YouTube videos that later mock it and are hilarious. I would refuse to call it Lord of the Rings. You know, it's just not. It's just garbage. It's, just, uh. you know, Danielle, Danielle, for listeners who don't know, that's my wife. Danielle said when we were watching it the other night, she couldn't put her finger on something. And she finally looked at me and she said, you know, she said it just has a B movie feel to it. And that's what's bothering me. She said it's like a B movie of Tolkien. It's like somebody took Tolkien and they made a low budget studio version. And uh, yeah. I think in some cases that's correct. It does feel like that. 
I watch it because I want it to live up to the feel of the epicness of Lord of the Rings, the original three movies, and it has never even gotten close. Now, the visuals have no. in the first couple episodes were kind of cool, but as soon as you get over that and you see the writing is horrible and the plot is slow and I mean, you know, I'm drifting off to sleep like, OK, what's going on? Who cares? The you know, the Harfoots are actually evil, <laughs> you know, um, it's just it's just stupid. And it's an insult to Tolkien. So I watch it because it was supposed to be good. And I love Lord of the Rings so much that I, I wish it would just be good because it deserved Same. to be. But then again, I'm like, OK, they spent a billion dollars just to see how bad a job they did, because this is, as I say, like an unmitigated disaster. But it's sad. Very sad. Very sad. Well, uh, when I had, what, what did you call it? Kid Rona? When I kid had COVID. Kid Rona, Kid COVID. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I watched the new version of RoboCop. And I <laughs> wanted to tell you about that because I know you and I have talked about kind of the hyper violent, weird version that was out when we were kids and how we can't believe we were allowed to watch it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, I was ill and it was on Amazon Prime and I thought, you know, it's got Michael Keaton and Gary Oldman in it. They're great. I, I love both of them. I thought so. At least I'll get to see them. So I'll watch it. You know what, man? I really, really enjoyed it uh, until the end. They really didn't stick the ending. The ending was kind of silly, but it takes the source material a little more seriously. And it it wrestles with questions of how would the public respond to AI on the streets and things like that. And it was fun, but the ending just kind of left me with, oh, man, you know, you missed the target on the ending. But it but at the same time, it's not a movie I'd ever watch again. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, here's speaking of movies that, you know, you have never watched. I never watched the Rocky movies. <gasps> I decided, <gasps> hey, you know, maybe I'll watch Rocky. So I watched Rocky. And um, well, that's about it. <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. I was what? Like, wait, uh, waiting for it to get. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it. I mean, I thought it would be a little bit more of like an epic ending, you know, but it was just like, okay, he gets wailed on and he endures a bunch of punching and then he's like, Adrian, and, and they decide they, they love each other. And, and that was the end. And I thought, man, I waited that long for that kind of ending, you know? Well, I can tell you that that is one of my all time favorite movie series. The first one? Uh, or, I, oh, so, okay. Because uh, maybe two is, I, is, is there one that's better than the other? Um, I mean... There's six and I love all of them except for five. Huh. So I love his story. I love the character of Rocky. I think it's a great series. So but I do think that as far as action and uh, villains and things like that, it gets better as the as it goes. Right. Well, well, let's get into the real business. Well, we've had a one week break, partially because Chad had. Kid COVID, but it's just been exactly. hectic as well. The Lando Calrissian quote is appropriate for me. I've had supply problems of every kind. I've had labor difficulties. So it was just good not to have to do a podcast last week. Plus, we know you're all reading through this book. What book are we talking about? A Rebel's Manifesto by Sean McDowell. Choosing truth, real justice, and love amid the noise of today's world. Hey, tonight's worksheet. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we're going to continue our deep dive into the book. As you remember, Chadwick, Chadwick the Great, was it? Oh, <laughs> what was your name? I, Chadwick. I, that's right. That's right. Chadwick the Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, last week, we talked about, uh, you know, the beginning part of things, standing for what's right in part one, becoming a good person, sort of laying the foundation. And now we get into these thorny issues of culture. Yeah, we're actually working through the book for family devotions right now, and we're in that first section. And the best way I could describe it is, is that before we start diving into the thorny cultural issues, as you said, that the first section just sets you up to say, like, what does it mean to be a Christian and what does it mean to think like a Christian? Mm -hmm. And now that we we know what it means to be a Christian and what it means to think like a Christian. Now let's dig into these issues now that we have those tools. 
The goal of the book is not to give you definitive answers to your questions so you don't have to do your own thinking or praying or considering. The goal, I would say, is giving you guidelines or how we might start to think Christianly about these topics. So it's going to give you sort of like introductory ideas and tools to sort of use your own wisdom and, and listening to God and praying and talking through the issues so you can figure out how you can think Christianly and apply things rightly. That was one of the points that I made when I reviewed the book that I like so much about the book is this is not uh, Sean McDowell spoon feeding you and telling you this is what you should <laughs> believe about these issues and just repeat these lines. It's him saying, OK, here's what the Bible has to say. Here are some tools that you can use to think through this. Your conclusion should be consistent with these principles. Now think about it. And mm -hmm. um, that's what I like about it so much is that it does invite discussion and prayer and and uh, thinking through these issues in a way that you're forming your own convictions. Because in that first section, he talks about to be like Daniel and to make sure that you are coming to moral conviction before you actually face the moral situation. Otherwise, you are apt to fall into sin if you're trying to develop your convictions kind of on the fly, be purposeful about it. And so yeah. that's what I like about the book. One of the many things I should say. Part two is culture, chapter six through nine. First chapter, they're dealing with smartphones slash social media, then entertainment, then politics, and then drugs. So the purpose of mm. this podcast is just to skim over those, give an overview of those and pull out some of the main ideas and things that are good takeaways from this section. So talking about smartphones, Sean is not against smartphones. He loves his smartphone. And he talks about how technology is not necessarily good or bad. It's neutral. It's how you use it. Sort of like an amplifier. Right. It's going to amplify whatever you plug into it. And that uh, one person's experience, whether like they're an older person who doesn't know anything about technology or a younger person who's wired into the matrix, <laughs> you know, these are just <laughs> different experiences. They're just different. They're not... Uh, you're not judging someone because they're more into technology or something like that. There's always been various technologies, but the goal in the chapter is to, in particular, think Christianly about smartphones and social media. And so he talks about your smartphone isn't the problem. The problem is how you use them. And he says the key question about our smartphones isn't if we use them, but how do we use them? They're morally neutral, neutral but it doesn't mean they're unimportant or uninfluential. I really liked when we interviewed Sean, how he talked about in regard to smartphones, how you don't want to come out of the gate talking to young people about smartphones, telling, saying something along the lines of smartphones are horrible, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the smartphones are really uh, important to them. And I love the shift that he kind of makes. And what you said was a perfect lead into this is that, look, you know, smartphones are actually more morally neutral. But it's important to point out to teens that smartphones do shape them yeah. in some kind of key ways. And I think that's a really thoughtful way to go about having a discussion that doesn't put the, the person on the defensive. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a conversation, you know, imagine with your daughter and, and you come in swinging, saying, you know, smartphones are terrible. Te Technology is terrible. You know, she's not really going to hear you out. Right. Because you're attacking something that's pretty important to her. Whereas mm -hmm. if you come and say, hey, you know, let's let's think about how smartphones shape us, you know, yeah. including you, yeah. you know, that I think is a really smart tack to take. When I'm thinking about this, I think about myself, like in the past week, I've listened to a whole bunch of like uh, John Wesley sermons, which has been amazing. They're like oh, uh, wow. mowing the lawn and whatnot or doing things and listening to sermons. You know, I can use it for listening to the Bible or reading the Bible or that sort of thing. But I also sit there and I can watch YouTube videos. And so, right. you know, it's how I use it. But the other thing when, when Sean's talking about how they shape us, I thought, well, you know, I can justify the use of it in the sense of like listening to sermons or uh, podcasts or reading on there. But even in doing that, it shapes how I think about that sort of content. I start, I could look at sermons as content. I could, mm. my failure could be, oh, if I listen to tons of these, this is good. It might not be good for me to listen <laughs> to, you know, just sermons all day long. You know, yeah. uh, it might be better for me to 
listen to one every few days and really meditate on that and think about that. Maybe we're not meant to be just pumping our brain full of tons of the Bible because we could deceive ourselves into thinking, well, now I'm spiritual. Let's get how yeah. much stuff I listened to or the most right. books I read. All right. <laughs> you know, you could not you could be a hearer only. So in that sense, smartphones could be used in a good way. But shaping that I'm trying to bring out here how it's shaping even what we would think is good. We could think we're doing good with it, but it, we're becoming a consumer of content rather than uh, maybe ruminating on the word or meditating on one single verse <laughs> for a for yeah. a long period of time or something. You know, so that's that's a takeaway for me on, in this section. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, and I mean, he talks about how screens affect us emotionally. They affect us spiritually. They affect our identities. They affect our relationships. One of the things I thought was super interesting that that stuck out to me because it, it kind of hit on a theme that you and I have talked about either with people we've interviewed or with each other on the podcast was how screens affect how we access truth. And he says in the book, he says, screens encourage us to focus on appearances rather than ideas. They encourage us to focus on popularity, meaning views or subscribers, or entertainment rather than truth. And in the example he gives is how he was giving a public lecture about same-sex unions, and someone basically challenged him and said, well, he, I think Matthew Vines, who, uh, for those of you that don't know who Matthew Vines is, he is a married man who uh, claims to be a Christian, and uh, he is a a uh, ma major player in the so-called Christian homosexual movement. And uh, he basically, this person told Sean that Matthew Vines has more authority to speak on this issue because he has more views on YouTube. So mm -hmm. it wasn't about credentials. It wasn't about the arguments. It was about who had more views. Yeah, you're more popular. Yeah. And so, and I mean, if you think about that, one of the shifts that I've seen, you know, I became a Christian when I was 25, I'm 45 now. One of the shifts I've even seen in watching debates and, and lectures and things like that is when someone's introduced, a lot of times now with their credentials, it's pointed out he has a YouTube channel that has this many followers or he's been on YouTube since this year. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just interesting that that is almost celebrated as much as the person's degree or or work, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Meaning, yeah. meaning their you know their work as far as published work and things like that. And so, to mm -hmm. me, that was very eye opening of of how it affects the way we access truth today. Yeah, good points. Under the uh, section where you're talking about screens affect us spiritually, he's saying that social media has a worldview that sort of shaped around individualism, the view right. that life is all about you. Social media is all about you. There's a temptation to post th something just to get the likes or the response or the affirmation. And that some people will compromise. Oh, I see I'm getting more attention if I dress like this or I am suggestive like this. And so you, you sort of go for what is rewarded through the attention. And that often is not hmm. going to be wholesome. Yeah. And I also thought that, you know, you begin to believe that your value comes from how many likes you get or how much attention you get or what the reaction that you get. And I love what he says. He says, the Bible says that we have value because we are made in the image of God, regardless of our race, biological sex, athletic ability, looks, or popularity. We have value because God made us in his image. Our value comes not from what we do, what we say, or what others think about us, but from what God says. And that's powerful. I mean, that's something I can tell you with two teenage daughters who, you know, understandably struggle with appearance and the things that young ladies struggle with. That's something we're constantly trying to help them understand is that your value comes from who God says you are. The mm -hmm. fact that you're created in the image of God, that you're of infinite worth. But it seems that social media pushes back against all of that, right? Yeah. 
Now, there's a lot more that could be said in a chapter on smartphones and social media. And so I oh, appreciate yeah. that that uh, he was very limited in his space to a lot to it. So I think he focuses a lot on social media here where I thought to myself, boy, what about this? What about that? You know, what about this when it comes to screens? So I just thought, well, what would I have put in there? <laughs> what comes to mind as far as <laughs> being an important topic? And I just, in a little pencil, I wrote along in the margin a number of points. The idea that you're just consuming content, uh, that it's screens can be a distraction, that it's training you just to entertain yourself, to get stimulation, to you can avoid other things because there's a screen that can fill the void. There's the aspect of dopamine where uh, these platforms and uh, technologies are always giving you something new. And so there's a dopamine hit. And so you go back, you go back and you keep scrolling. There's the aspect of focus where everything is shorter and shorter focus, where you've got like TikTok videos or YouTube shorts. They're smaller and smaller videos because they're just trying to quickly get your attention. And so we're, I think it trains us to not focus for long periods. It takes away the aspect of reading paper books. I think that it makes us shallow because it all it is all about appearances. Mm. There's the aspect of how it takes our attention away. There's the, and he doesn't touch on it here. I think maybe he'll save it for another <laughs> chapter, but there's the aspect of porn becoming a, a real accessible temptation and pit to fall into really easily because uh, it's yes. just instantly a click away. Another aspect is that when you're in the virtual world, you're not present. Uh, you could be sitting across from someone and look at your phone and suddenly you're not there with them. You're mm. wherever the picture you're looking at, you're there <laughs> or you're in a different conversation. So it's so easy to make you not present. You're being consumed by the entertainment and that and also it can become a, a digital babysitter. So, I mean, these were just like things were come to my mind uh, and I don't mean to elaborate fully on any of these, but I think it's just helpful just to point out that just because Sean didn't go deep into that, that, that is such an important subject because of those sorts of things. I mean, if it take me one minute to make a list like that of just things that come to mind, how important is it for us to look into that? And of course, I'm speaking to myself. So, yeah, he, he gives us some tips, though for using technology wisely. Yeah, the tips I thought were really good. And I, I did find myself thinking about, by the way, those were really good thoughts you shared, but I did find myself thinking as I was reading these, I wonder what would happen if everyone followed these kind of tips, how, what, what the changes would be. <laughs> yeah, I'll, let, yeah. I'll let the listener uh, draw their own conclusions there. But first of all, he says, think before posting a picture, a video, or a comment. And uh, it, it says, you know, he points out that anything posted online is potentially permanent. So you should err on the side of caution. I know I, I read countless comments on the Internet that I think to myself, I wish that person would have thought before they would have posted that. And I know I've done that before in the past. He also talks about taking a break from the smartphone, having a specific time during the day where you take a break from it. An indicator that you need to do this might be that if you start to take a break and you find yourself feeling a little anxious without your cell phone, you might have a problem. And then he talks about using technology for good. Use If you have a platform, use it. Don't use it for popularity, to build your own status, but to advance the kingdom of God. And you can do that through various ways, sharing apologetic resources, sharing Bible verses, and various things like that. And then finally, and this was the big one, Brian, that I was thinking, man, I wish more people would follow this one, is just be positive, Yeah. right? Quit looking to criticize everyone and everything and to make short, pithy, little, smart-alecky comments and just think about how can you build others up? How can you encourage people? How can you share the gospel? Just these four tips, you know, coupled with a lot of the ones you said would just be so transformative because social media is in many senses kind of a, a cesspool and uh, it doesn't <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't need to be right. Uh, so, yeah, I thought those tips were really practical and the, the tips were very indicative of how he ends a lot of the chapters, right, mm -hmm. of just tips and things that can help us live more Christianly, as he says in the first section. Now, before we go on to the next subject, I just want to remind everyone to like, subscribe, and be sure to smash that subscribe <laughs> button. Click the bell so that you're instantly notified when the next podcast comes out. <laughs>
<laughs> also, if you like to donate to Apologetics uh, yes, 315. And, and get on there on Patreon for all the special freebies for those who pay us. Yeah, yeah. we'll be picking one of our Patreons uh, for <laughs> free T-shirts and swag. <laughs> With Brian and I, you'll get a Brian and Chad bobblehead set, uh, oh. which is really exciting. Uh, uh, yes. Wow. So the next chapter, next chapter was one of my favorites just because this is one of the ways that I'm at least by the grace of God able to have a lot of great conversations about Christianity and it's through entertainment. He begins just talking about how uh, he took his 14 year old son to see Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, which is of course the, the story of Freddie Mercury, who uh, was the um, homosexual lead singer of uh, Queen. Sorry. Oh my gosh. I almost couldn't remember that. Wayne and Garth would be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and how he used that as the, a platform to have a discussion with his son. And I think that's precisely the way that we should be using entertainment to promote great conversations and also to help our kids think through the, what they're consuming because they're not always going to be with us. And so if we can do that while they're with us, we're preparing them when they go out on their own and they're consuming entertainment. Mm hmm. One thing he talks about here, does media really affect us? And he says, well, you know, why would companies spend millions and millions to advertise if they didn't right. think you're going to buy something from the ad? But he says, you know, in the media we consume shapes our thinking and our acting. And he talks about how movies can be an especially powerful means of persuasion because we let down our guards when watching them. Mm. When I watched Rocky, I didn't let down my guard. Otherwise, I would have got punched. So, exactly. Uh, yeah. But, Apollo know. would have nailed you. Exactly. Yes. So I really love the way he, he encourages people to think through films through the, the lens of worldview. Uh, he, he explains worldview in that first section and, and how Christians need to think in this way and how everybody has a worldview. And he talks about how every movie is told from a worldview perspective, whether it be the, the Christian perspective or the naturalistic one, the, the pantheistic one. And I love how he encourages us to think through those films and, and talk about what perspective they're offering and which perspective are these movies more consistent with and the like. Yeah. It gives you various questions about, you know, what a worldview a answers. How did we get here? What went wrong? And how do we fix it? Every worldview answers those sorts of questions. And in the same way, movies, for instance, take on those sorts of questions. Uh, act one, act two, act three. You know, who are we? How did we get here? What happened to mess everything up? And how do we fix it? So through this chapter, he gives us a few tools for, you know, assessing what, what's in a piece of entertainment or movie or whatever. What sort of worldview does it assume? What is it trying to teach you through that? And he gives you guidelines as well for assessing a movie like, uh, you know, is there anything good about this movie that I can praise? What should I be concerned about? Do we see the consequences of sin or are sinful actions ignored or praised? What's the moral mm -hmm. of the story? Should we embrace this or should we be concerned about it? You know, how are Christians portrayed? Is that what's the worldview behind the film? So a lot of good tools here. And there's a little bit of overlap in the content from our Frank Turek discussion uh, from a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Hollywood heroes. I just wrote down Hollywood heroes when you were talking. Wow. 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 wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just giving a plug for one of our favorite uh, YouTube channels, Pitch Meeting. Yeah. It's wonderful. I do think one of the important parts, though, when he was closing out this chapter that's worth mentioning is, is that Jesus did use stories, obviously parables, mm -hmm. and uh, that shows the importance of them. And and I think that one of the things that we can do, which Frank, it, Frank and his son so well illustrate in Hollywood Heroes, is that we can use these stories as a type of kind of modern parable. I like what he says there at the end. He says, movies can capture our hearts and shape the way we live. This is also true for TV shows, songs, and other forms of entertainment. I love watching movies, and my guess is that you do too but let's watch them with wisdom and discernment. And I think this chapter kind of equips us to be able to do that. Okay, enough entertainment. Let's talk about politics. Oh, uh, yeah. Chap chapter 8 talks about politics. And why is there a chapter in here on it? Well, Sean explains why there's a chapter. Politics it addresses questions such as, how do we create a just society? How do we deal with differences? 
How can we work together for the common good? And these are all vital questions because they relate to the greater call to love our neighbors. So mm. I, I like how this is framed because it's basically framed around the greatest commandments, love God and love our neighbor. And how politics relates to how might we best love our neighbor in society. So the goal of this chapter is help you to think Christianly about politics. He starts off by talking about how leading with charity. We love our neighbor in thinking about politics and we love our neighbor in speaking about politics. So even though he talks about how politics can be inherently divisive, that we need to lead with love, lead with charity. And basically, again, how he frames the whole issue around the greatest commandment to love God and our neighbor. Right. Yeah. And I'll tell you what I really liked about this chapter is and just he does address just for those who are, are interested in checking it out, that idea of the claim that Jesus said to keep God and Caesar, a.k.a. government separate. And he does take some time to kind of unpack that. And uh, but I love how he talks about avoiding extremes. Because you and I have talked so many times about how that's one of the biggest issues, particularly in American politics. I obviously can't speak to over in the UK there. But one of the issues in American politics is that it is so, so divisive. And there there are such extremes on both sides of the issue. And uh, I, I love the encouragement that he has is that he, he says this. He says, our ultimate hope must be in the Lord. Politics cannot fix the deepest problems with our society, the human heart. Our ultimate allegiance must not be to a political party, but to God. And I think that if that is our one of our guiding principles, then I think that it is going to help us avoid extremes. Obviously, your convictions, you know, more likely are going to land you more in one party than the other, which is completely understandable. But at the same time, you want to make sure that your hope and trust is in in the Lord. And I think that can keep us from avoiding those extremes and putting our our hope and our faith in government. Because unfortunately, uh, as Sean points out here, is that government ultimately isn't going to fix things. I thought that was huge. But the, my favorite part, Brian, about the chapter and I actually wrote a blog post based on this, was how he talks about the four principles that should shape a Christian's political thinking. Yeah. And I thought this part. was, yeah, this was by far the best part, uh, which is why I made a post about it, because kind of walking into the political arena is dangerous these days, especially as a Christian, because you, if you say the wrong thing, there's going to be a large group of people that hate you. And so I thought this was just so good. As far as, look, these need to be our guiding principles. So I'll go through them real quick. The first one was, the stranger is my neighbor. And he says, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan to indicate that we have a duty to treat our neighbors lovingly. And Jesus expanded the definition of who our neighbors are to include people who are not like us and even our enemies. Principle two, regardless of race, sex, or age, every human life must be protected as all humans have been made in the image of God. Genesis 127. Principle number three, care for the poor and marginalized is crucial as God cares for the poor. And he cites their Deuteronomy and the Psalms and Proverbs. And then finally, principle number four, we must seek justice. Scripture calls both individuals and the state to act justly. And that's Micah 6, 8 and Psalm 72. So for me, when you, we're dealing with so many of these complex topics that Sean obviously addresses in the book and that we'll continue to address as we do the deep dive, it's so nice to have these principles to go back to and use them as kind of a grid to help me think through each political issue. Yeah, good stuff. To quickly wrap up our summary of the chapter, there are two common myths that Sean McDowell uh, talks about uh, in regards to politics. One, that good intentions are enough. The idea here is that just because there's a policy that has good intentions, it doesn't therefore mean that it's going to work and therefore you should vote for it. It might be a complete, absolute fail with great intentions. So you need to assess the things that you're voting for. Uh, you can't rely upon good intentions, yet, but you have to support things that genuinely help people. The mm. second myth is this idea that you can't legislate morality. It's, and he explains how that's um, silly, that uh, that's the only thing you can legislate, what you think is right 
So he says the question is not if the government will legislate, legislate morality, but what morality it will legislate. So it's just a matter of whose morality is being legislated, not can you can't legislate morality. Right. Well, I don't know about you, but I was kind of shocked at the end of the chapter. He gives quick four suggestions for thinking Christianly about politics. And this first mm -hmm. one blew my mind, man. He said, realize that every news source has a bias. What? I, I, I was no. like, what are you talking about, dude? I'm, I'm... <laughs> That's crazy. And of course, we're jesting. Uh, every news source has a bias. He also points out that you need to recognize that modern practice of politics is driven by emotion. I think this is incredibly important. Uh, we are being manipulated emotionally, and we do need to get back to arguments and what makes sense. And of course, study both sides of the issue. And then finally, make sure you're motivated by love. And he says to see First Corinthians 13, one through three. And what I like to what I thought was funny here is, is one of the arguments you'll often hear, Brian, against religious people is, you know, oh, you're, you're brainwashing your children. Well, what is Sean saying here in the book? He's literally like study both sides of the issue. Yeah. Make sure point. you look at both sides of the issue. Make sure you're looking at sources. He's literally teaching people how to think critically. That is not <laughs> indoctrinating someone. Yeah. So I thought those were helpful tips and you thought they were funny. So I ain't always go. indoctrinate my kids with raw logic. That's right. My kids are like Spock. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. So we'll end with this chapter, chapter nine in section two of under culture. Drugs and addiction. Yeah. He starts it out with a provocative question. If God made everything, then why is it wrong to smoke marijuana? And so he asks that provocative question and says, well, how would you answer this? And he talks how he made a short video uh, response to that question. It was one of his top social media videos ever, uh, mm. clearly hitting a nerve. And so talks about how cultures changed where things used to be like, of course, that's wrong. And now things are like, oh, well, it was wrong before, but now it's not wrong anymore. Now it's legal. So it's OK. So he says, be before we delve into some of the details, consider a deeper question before, you know, you ask questions like that. You, you might have to ask a few more fundamental questions. Why are people so powerfully drawn to drugs? And he suggests that at heart, the issue is relational brokenness. Now, and then he goes into talking about a Christian view of drugs and alcohol. Well, we'll get into those in a moment. But what are your thoughts on this topic in in general, Chad? Well, I think it it's obviously important to understand how to think about it Christianly, as he says, because it is becoming something that's more and more acceptable, and it's also becoming something that is more and more accessible to our uh, children. And we just had to have a conversation with Emma and Lily the other day because I don't know if this is happening again in the UK. Um, you can certainly speak to that, but uh, there, there's beginning to be fentanyl that is showing up on the streets over here that literally looks like candy. And uh, it, it looks like um, like Skittles or sweet tarts. And so uh, being able to think about not only being able to recognize what these things look like, right, but also to think about what would God have us do. Um, and, and I think it was an apt way to start the chapter with the question of, well, you know, God made marijuana, so why is it wrong? Because uh, we do need to help our kids navigate this and think through it because they are they're going to be offered these things. It's just a matter of when and where. And so we need to make sure that they're prepared to think through that. Yeah. So I think there's some serious things to be thinking about principles that need to be laid down underneath the question to guide the answer. Because if you are guided by, oh, they're doing it and they're a Christian, so it must be OK. Or. No, well, God made it. Uh, I don't see what's wrong with it because other people are doing, you know, there's all these sort of cultural justifications or rationalizations or whatever you want to call it that could lead you down the, the wrong path. So Sean McDowell here, he lays down a few important points to consider. Number one, our bodies are a gift from God to misuse them is to bring harm to something that is not our own. So it talks about how, for instance, drinking, smoking, taking drugs are not only illegal, uh, in most of the cases, but they're wrong because they can so de easily damage God's property or the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. And that leads into perfectly to the next one is that our bodies are holy for God. Um, the spirit of God on the Christian view dwells within us. So he argues that shouldn't we do everything to honor 
uh, his presence. I suppose the argument would need to be made by the person who is using these things and abusing these things is that this is somehow consistent with the Christian view. And of course, Sean is arguing that it is not. The other principle he lays down is that our minds are to love God and that we're not to be controlled by anything except the Holy Spirit. And that reminds me of the scripture where it says, you know, don't be drunk on wine, which leads to exactly. uh, debauchery. But I always think that that's important to point out that he's not saying, hey, drinking wine is wrong. He's saying, don't be drunk on something which leads to something else. So there's exactly. this aspect of the drunkenness where inhibitions are, are gone. You're not thinking like you would normally think. And so you're doing things you wouldn't normally do under your, in your right mind. So mm-hmm. I think things that alter your mental state, that take away inhibitions, that cause you to not remember what happened mm. or cause you to lose control or even become dangerous, angry, uh, abusive, you know, all these different things that these substances or alcohol, whatever they can do, dull your senses, all these sorts of alterations of, of your consciousness, basically, they're going to lead to other things. So there's the there's that aspect of the of the risk involved. I think that the argument that you just made there is the most persuasive to me personally. I know some people find different arguments more persuasive mm-hmm. than others. To me, that's the most persuasive argument, that that idea of it does alter the way we think, it does alter the way, and, and that idea of not being drunk with wine because of the consequences, to me, is very powerful in the sense that I think it applies just as much to marijuana or other drugs. And I like what he says here at the, at the end of that section on our minds are to love God. He says, Like a virus that evades a computer, invades a computer, excuse me, drugs and alcohol can destroy the proper functioning of its host, you. When you give up control of your mind, you open yourself to deception and manipulation. Taking drugs steals your freedom. Rather than living in slavery to our passions, which includes drunkenness, Paul invites Christians to live by the spirit, which brings self-control and the freedom to love others. And then... I like the way that he he goes on to address it. He he talks about marijuana, talks about alcohol, talks about vaping, which I thought was really interesting mm-hmm. uh, because vaping, it it's slowly becoming health effects are more and more coming to the surface over here in the mm-hmm. United States. But there for a while, man, when vaping first came out, it was like the healthy alternative to smoking. I yeah. mean, that's how it was. That's how it was sold over here. Yeah. And people were sm- I remember once I was preaching at the Hagerstown Rescue Mission and I was outside talking to the pastor. This guy walked up to him that I guess had been in the mission program. And uh, uh, Pastor Lynn was the pastor's name. And he said to this guy, hey, what's up? And of course, one of their rules is that you can't smoke if you're in the yeah. program. But this guy had graduated from it and he was standing there vaping. And he said, what are you doing? And, and the guy was vaping Captain Crunch. Uh, <laughs> that was that, that was like the flavor, you know? Yeah. But uh, just as a, I just thought that was kind of a funny side note. But what Sean does is he lays out kind of the statistics and the facts, uh, particularly around marijuana and vaping, and gives references for those who want to look into it of, of the issues and the health concerns that these things cause. I, th- I think it's a good way to argue to have those facts on hand when we're talking to him about these things, because that, that can be compelling for people who are reasonable. When it comes to the facts that are laid out here by Sean, when it comes to marijuana, and he lists three or four or five different negative effects and alcohol mm-hmm. and the negative effects and the vaping and the negative effects, to me, the word that comes to my mind is risk. All of these things have risks to certain degrees. You could argue, say, well, that doesn't happen every time. That doesn't happen every, to every person. Oh, it's not that bad. But all of these are possible risks. And you're basically saying, you know what? I'm going to be okay when I do this because I'm different. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I right. know this killed his other people. I know this person died <laughs> from it. I know this, this person, their life went off the rails and this person has lung problems, but I'm different. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. this idea it, of risky behavior, um, you just, you're not being wise. You're being unwise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there are risks in life that are worth taking. And then there are risks in life that are clearly not worth taking. And uh, I, 
you know, again, I'll leave it to the listener to decide whether or not this is one worth taking. I don't think evidentially it is. The attribute here of being addictive. Anything that is Mm. addictive, you become the person who's not in control. You say, I'll stop when, uh, but it's the last one. But then you go against your own choice. Like I said, I was going to do it no more. And I just did it again, saying that this would be the last time. And then I said, this would be the last time. And And you're addicted. So that to me is the biggest warning sign that anything that is addictive, you just need to stay away because you're no longer going to be the one in control. Now, obviously, there are different degrees. All of these are addictive to a certain point. I mean, people trying to quit nicotine and can't. (laughs) Yes. And it seems like such a small thing, but now you're not in control. And that's, it's just back to wisdom. Why would you put yourself in that risk to possibly be trapped in something that you can't control? So that's a great point. And I mean, that is very much like, It's a very defeating place to be when you're addicted to something because you get yourself built up and uh, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit and I'm done. And you you do the thing that you're addicted to and you've made up your mind. That's the last time I'm ever going to do it. And you go to God and you pray and you say, Lord, I'm done. I'm giving this over to you. I'm never going to do it again. And then it's such a defeater. In the way, in Alvin Plantinga would say, <laughs> but in a different way. <laughs> but uh, it's such a feeling of defeat, remorse, uh, regret, just a sick feeling in your stomach when you fall again and again and again. And so we don't want our young people or, or you know, a, a people that we love to be in that situation where they're in that uh, cycle of addiction. And so Sean talks about at the end of the chapter there three steps that our young people can take to kind of stand strong when they're faced with these temptations. And and number one is to choose your friends wisely. And uh, my wife has a friend who tells her own kids, uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, he just flat out says, avoid people who are going to encourage you to be drunk, to smoke, to take drugs. And by the way, least people think that we are hyper stuffy at my house. My my wife drinks wine occasionally, and uh, we have no issue with people having alcohol. The Bible condemns drunkenness. It doesn't condemn alcohol consumption. Obviously, see Jesus and the wedding. Uh, secondly, avoid potential compromising situations. He says here, as a high school student, I promised my parents I wouldn't drink. I also would not allow a student in my car who had taken a sip of alcohol. And he says, let me encourage you to take the same pledge. And so if you know that these situations are potentially going to put you in a place that you're going to have to deal with this, just stay away from the situation. And then finally, he says, if you're taking drugs, get help from someone rather than escape your problems. And he says that uh, you can find freedom for this addiction. God loves you, and there are people in your life who will help. Start by sharing with a trusted adult. And so if you're taking drugs, get help from someone rather than escaping your problems. What he means there is, is a lot of times these drugs are taken to escape reality or to deal with reality. But unfortunately, they just ultimately make things worse. So I thought those were great tips. Very practical. Yeah. Again, uh, the book is Rebels Manifesto, Choosing Truth, Real Justice and Love Amid the Noise of Today's World by Sean McDowell. We're linking to it in the show notes, as always, where you find all those tasty little tidbits all laid out for your clickability. And check out, uh, make sure you check out our interview with Sean. If you haven't yet on Rebels Manifesto, you can find that on Apologetics 315 podcast. Yeah. Next week, we'll be talking about relationships. Join us then and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. We also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. 
Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetic stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening.